my name is Devin Altman. I'm with an SBA as a bridge steel specialist in the Steel Solutions Center. So we have a few learning objectives today. Uh, we want to be able to understand how to develop the input, how to read the output in, in LRFD Simon, uh, try to interpret uh, that, that output as well as increase resistance when we need, as well as potentially decrease the resistance for, for bridge economy. Also, we wanna uh, learn about uh, when and where uh, LRFD Simon is applicable and where it is not. I think Brandon and Dominic talked a little bit about that on Monday. And um, some basic understanding of the continuous span standards, where those are located and how you can get those. So these are the two tools. They're both free and they're on our website. I'll show you where to get those. The continuous span standards uh, provide you an example of steel girder detail, um, even some specification language uh, for your general notes. They're all five girder bridge uh, cross sections with uh, balanced designs. And it is per um, ASH LRFD, the seventh edition on the last update. And we do plan on updating that later this year for the ninth edition. Simon is a line girder analysis software. There's a design mode, analysis mode. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we can also uh, determine what's the most efficient section from the web depth optimization. And currently it's, it's the eighth edition of ASHTO LRFD bridge design specification. And that update should be coming uh, soon as well. So where can you find these free tools that we're discussing today? Um, www w.aisc.org backslash NSBA will take you to this left screen. And if you select the design and estimating link, it'll take you to the screen on the right. And both of these tools are under our design resources and software. So just a little bit more about each one before we jump into the example. Uh, the continuous span standards were primarily developed for TSNL. Uh, that's type, size, and location. Uh, generally, that's 30% design phase. And uh, they do are accompanied with the LRFD Simon input files. I'll be using one of those for my example today. And they give you uh, flange and web sizes, diaphragm spacing, stiffener locations, some, some girder quantities, shear connector design as well. And it comes with your camber table as well that you can use for your project. Uh, I, I did mention it was based on uh, balanced uh, design. And so it's, it's all predicated on that center span that ranges uh, from 150 to 300 feet. Those end spans are idealized for 78% of that seven, uh, 78% of that center span. And the girder spacings range from about seven and a half feet to 12 feet for both homogeneous and hybrid designs. Uh, the web depth has been optimized for material efficiency, and there's 88 unique solutions that you can use for your projects. A little bit more about Simon. It's a it's a really powerful line girder analysis um, software program. It's it can do steel eye girders as well as uh, box girder bridges that are both shown here on the right. It's capable of modeling linear and parabolic haunches if your section's changing in depth. I mentioned uh, the update coming later this summer, and it's primarily um, suited for straight steel bridges that have minimal to zero skew angles at their substructure supports. It also allows us to investigate um, exterior girders and interior girders independently, uh, as well as it's, it's capable of modeling complex geometry and unique loading configurations. We can develop our service and strength moment shears, deflections, and bearing reactions. We can then take for, for substructure design, our bearing pad design, and, and other parts of the project. And I also wanted to mention the uh, user's guide. Uh, you would toggle with this question mark GUI icon in the program. It pops this up, and this was developed um, and written by Mike Grubb and Associates that have about 40 years design experience. So there's a lot of wisdom and user tips in there that are really unique. So if you just open that up, 
and search for where you are in the program, you can usually find a lot more in-depth information if you're wondering about something. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is, is kind of predicated on some, some information I just wanna go through really quickly. Uh, I mentioned the, the balanced um, load arrangement and what we mean by balance is we're, we're trying to maximize, or we're trying to get these positive moments in span one and two and three to equal each other essentially. And um, I mentioned what the continuous span standard is using 78%, but sometimes that can fluctuate from about 75 to 82% of the center span. Um, there's also the cantilever uh, balance for your deck overhangs. Um, generally, we want that about 28 to 35% of the, the interior girder spacing. And uh, we need to be mindful also of our, of our deck overhangs. Um, they take uh, impact load from a truck so laterally hitting that barrier and then kind of treating that as a diving board so you, you need to make sure your, your overhangs don't get too big so they can take your crash load so this is an optional span to depth ratio in ash to lrfd but it's a it's a good starting spot for your web depth it, it can change if you're simple or continuous and uh, based on if you're composite or non-composite I, I think this one's a little bit more important here. Um, typically, we're going to be um, designing and detailing girders without longitudinal stiffeners. So D over T, it's the depth of our web divided by the thickness. It has to be less than or equal to 150. I generally like about 100 to 120, and that's um, to get a partially stiffened web to eliminate any web web thickness change changes within my steel plate girder, as well as um, to limit the number of stiffeners used. And a half inch minimum thickness is preferred by fabricators for handling. So I, I would start there as your minimum. There's some other proportioning uh, requirements in ASH LRFD that sometimes control our designs. B over 2T um, needs to be less than or equal to 12 for our flanges. And um, we also need to balance our um, moment of inertia for our compression flange and our tension flange it needs to be somewhere between 0.1 and 10. And in general, um, I would start with three quarters of an inch by, by 12, 12 inches wide as, as kind of a starting spot. And there's more information in our G12.1 document on this that I would recommend everybody looking at if they're doing a steel girder design. And the one last thing I want to mention before we jump in the example is shipping, um, whether you're steel or concrete, uh, generally, these, these girders are, are fabricated and um, developed beforehand and then shipped on truck, not, not on freight. And in general, we, we can, it, it kind of depends on where your project's located and um, if the bridge site is easily accessible or if it's more remote and difficult to get to. But um, I would say 80 to 120 feet is pretty typical. And, you know, 150 I've seen pretty common for. Uh, for, for, for most most easily accessible uh, bridge sites, but I have seen up to 215 feet shipped as well. So think about your weight, your, your height and your width, and, and hopefully you're not deeper than nine feet because that's when it gets a little bit more difficult to ship. So with all that in mind, we're gonna go ahead and get started on our design example here. And we're gonna suppose that this is our span arrangement, which is not in the continuous span standards where we have 165 foot in spans and a 200 foot center span. Our bridge cross section, it looks like this. We have a three foot one inch overhangs and 12 foot four inch girder spacing. We have an eight and a half inch uh, bridge deck, constant thickness and uh, an edge deck thickness of a little bit thicker. 40 foot roadway, 43 foot, two inches out to out for our bridge deck. So keep that in mind. So it's, so it's different. Do we have to start over and develop everything from scratch? Well, no, um, if, if you're on our website, we actually even say that, you know, we understand most times you can't get the ideal span arrangement to, to work. So that's why we are providing the Simon files. And uh, in general, um, 
I, I would say you still you still need to do the the work, the hard part, and that's uh, you know developing your loads, your assumptions, comparing those with what's being used here in the continuous span standards. Sometimes you're limited um, for your superstructure depth and your maybe your minimum vertical clearance below um, is controlling. So maybe you have to um, shallow up your, your superstructure depth. For this example, we have a, a lower than ideal a cantilever balance of 0.25. Um, so it, it's not too, too concerning, but it is, is not kind of that ideal arrangement. And in general, when I, when I take anybody's files, um, you need to verify and check everything. So I generally, as a, as a structural bridge engineer, try to assume it's all wrong and verify it um, and, and validate it essentially. So here's where we grab those, those Simon files. If, uh, if you extract those files, um, we would then go into the Simon input files folder. Uh, we're, we're gonna do a homogenous design all the same material, ASTM A709, grade 50W. And that 12 foot uh, spacing is closest to ours. And you can see there is a 164, 210, 164 span arrangement. That's pretty close to what we got. It doesn't match our girder space in our overhang, but um, you know, it's close. So we'll take that file and we'll open it up. And I would recommend everybody um, showing their input in some kind of spreadsheet-based software. I, I use Excel or MathCAD's my preference, but uh, it, in general, you want your, your work to be checked by somebody else where nobody's perfect and we can all make mistakes. So I, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I've also shown, shown my design assumptions. Um, I have a little bit different feature wearing surface, 20 PSF, and it's evenly distributed all girders. I have a 528 um, pounds per lineal foot bridge barriers on, on both um, outer portions of the deck. I'm assuming to apply a two inch concrete haunch load by the width of my, my top flange to, to all girders. And our, um, we had two travel lanes. So our, um, the number of trucks per, um, in a single lane uh, actually falls under fatigue two category. So we're, we're not gonna use infinite fatigue life. And we're, we're gonna assume um, for our project that we're gonna distribute all of our composite and non-composite loading evenly to all girders. So it's a little bit different. And so let's go ahead and go through what I, what I updated and changed. I'll just go ahead and start working our way down. We work our way from top to bottom of those uh, tree, tree menus there in Simon. So the, the first one's the general properties. Those top three comment lines can be anything you want. I'd recommend um, using something that's easily to identify uh, what, what type of run this is. So, you know, bridge geometry, it's an exterior girder file, that kind of thing. The next thing is for the, the bridge layout. So we're doing a um, steel plate eye girder. So we've selected that and, but could also be a box girder. And number of spans, we, we, that didn't have to change. That was still three. We had one less girder and cross section and one less traffic lane. And we're using the analysis mode for our run option, but there's also the design option, which I'll show a little bit later. And these next four parameters are for that design, basically where it's gonna reiterate if the design performance ratio is too small. So 0 0.9, we want, we want a really efficient design. And then what the maximum performance ratio is so we, we set that at 1.0 because we don't want anything overstressed or anything like that for our bridge design. And then if it's doing design mode, it'll also use these minimum and maximum um, thicknesses for our flanges. And down here, we, we, as, as we progress further down, uh, it's, it's basically the deck properties where um, the longitudinal reinforcement uh, centroid is located. And that's, that's gonna be used for our um, negative moment capacity when it's our tension flange over our piers. And we're using a four inch haunch, which includes our, um, our steel top flange, but also has some concrete buildup in there as well. And so there's the 800 um, trucks per day in a single lane. As I mentioned before, that's gonna be fatigue two. 
going going down the line. Um, next is the distribution factors. So you can have Simon calculate these for you. And what's great out here is what you would you would enter for this bridge, um, the spacing, the skew, and the DE, which is basically your bridge overhang minus your bridge barrier width and allows you where you can first place a truck and a lane essentially on your bridge. And it would be an exterior girder file. I did manually um, calculate these and I'll go into that a little bit further. And these are the values I calculated. Same for moment and shear. So I alluded to this, the, the main reason I calculated these by hand is this uh, 4.6.2.2.2 D section of Ashdell RFD. And um, there's a rigid body cross section, um, which, which, which essentially we're, we're saying our superstructure acts as a unit. It, it rotates and deflects together. If anyone's done abutment design on pipe piles or um, H piles, this is also how you kind of design those where you you load it up across the cross section and you're essentially solving for the, the, the largest couple force you can create. And currently Simon doesn't, doesn't compute this live load distribution factor and it can commonly control um, it be a higher magnitude than the others. So, but I did want to mention um, it will, the new update that's coming later this summer, it will include this distribution factor. So that's, that's good news. So then we're going to go into our material properties. This is basically our deck and our stiffener properties. We're not using a longitudinal stiffener, but we are using the transverse and variant stiffeners and other miscellaneous and material properties. We're using normal weight concrete. We're using weathering steel for our corrosion protection. And we're using welded connection plates for our cross frames and other transverse and variant stiffeners. And the slab criteria, this is essentially the minimum uh, negative moment steel um, in Astro LRFD. And um, it requires 1% um, steel based on the area of your, of your concrete deck. And we're gonna go ahead and provide that over our piers. So then under the loads tab, this really should, um, you should think about this as the composite um, loads. So this is the, the loads acting after the concrete deck is hardened and cured and our steel I-beam uh, acts together with that concrete deck and we get an additional um, sectional resistance. So this is basically our barrier load evenly distributed, two barriers uh, divided by four girders and our future wiring surface loaded up essentially from barrier to barrier and then divided evenly to all girders. And then this is basically the live load that also acts on the composite section. We're gonna use HL93 loading. Our live load deflection factor is L over 800. And that's because it's only a vehicular traffic bridge. There's no pedestrians, but if there were pedestrians, we had a sidewalk, maybe a trail, this would be then a thousand. So we don't have any pedestrian live load. And these are the impact factors for our design truck and our fatigue truck. So we're not using a user-defined vehicle, but um, I did want to mention and show this. You know, if you have a super super load or emergency vehicle or permit vehicle for your project, you can go ahead and enter that in here, and up to forty axles. Next, we have our transverse stiffener properties. It's probably the smallest numbers of input for any of the the tabs. We're going to go ahead and use our maximum cross frame spacing. Uh, this is in the center of, of the second span, 32 feet. And we're going to go ahead and use one-sided stiffeners. This is an exterior girder. Uh, you can also do that for interior girders. It depends on how, you're, um, how you want to look at shear and how you're thinking about connecting your cross frames. The shear stud um, properties. So, so we can have Simon... Uh, go ahead and run the design of our shear studs, which is really nice. We've go ahead, gone ahead and toggled the S and we're starting it right at our um, center line of support. Uh, we're using a smaller modulus for the unreinforced concrete. The desirable pitch, this is gonna go ahead and be the longitudinal spacing along the girder. 
we're using seven eighth inch diameter studs that are six inches long. And we're gonna try for two studs per row. And then, so that, that was everything in the model, the model tree. And now we're gonna go into the span information. The first span is can never be symmetrical. Um, any span after that can. So that's why that's gonna be grayed out here. And went ahead and entered in our 165 foot span. And then our non-composite um, dead load, which is essentially um, all of the all the load acting on our just our steel plate girder itself. So that's like our wet concrete and haunch, cross frames, field splices, miscellaneous details, anything else that you might have just acting on your steel plate girder section. So we have about 1,224 pounds per lineal foot. Um, and we don't have any um, partial dead loads, but if you had maybe a signed blister or um, maybe a light blister um, that, that maybe started and stopped within the span, you could go ahead and enter those in here. The bottom flange cross frame spacing, that is with respect to the compression flange. Um, so as we get closer to our pier, we're gonna have a tighter cross frame space at 20 feet. And out in the span, we're going to widen that up and uh, increase that to 29 feet. The construction lateral moment, um, a lot of times this will be included for our exterior girders. Uh, for this project, we're going to go ahead and shore up our girder and prevent that um, overhang bracket from, from transmitting any moment. But that might be a consideration for you and your project. So working our way down to span two, pretty much everything stayed the same. Um, it, it's still not symmetrical. We have another span. Uh, it's the same DC1 loading, the same pier cross frame spacing of 20 feet for the bottom flange in the negative moment region. But it, it widens up a little bit more to 32 feet in the center span based on our geometry. And for the third one, it's the easiest thing when our uh, span three is the mirror image of span one. We can go ahead and toggle yes, and everything else is going to be grayed out. And it's going to use the span one information, the mirror image, to um, to analyze and look at that. So now uh, it, we've gone ahead and finished the span information, and now we're going to go ahead and go into the cross section. Um, it starts out on the web web tab, and I I recommend everybody. Um, entering in their cross frame locations. That's, that's what each one of these locations is, is where my cross frames are. And that's because uh, for fatigue, it's gonna be controlled by category C prime detail at that transverse stiffener for the bottom flange. Um, and, and so sometimes that will control your bottom flange thicknesses. So I, so I like to enter in all my uh, cross frame locations if I can. And I also have my field splice location of 120 feet there. You can see we're not varying our web depth. We have a constant 80 inches and we're using 11 sixteenths of an inch for the thickness, which gives us a D over T ratio of about 116. We don't have any uh, longitudinal stiffeners, but if we did, we could enter those in. We are transversely stiffening all of our sections, but we could also see how that changes if, if you don't have stiffeners and don't need cross frames for a shorter span perhaps. And we've calculated the minimum transverse stiffener spacing that's given, uh, there's an equation in the, the Simon user's guide to easily calculate this based on your geometry. So next we go to the top flange. Uh, you can see we have three flange sizes in span one. And the end location, so it's basically taking from zero to 120 feet. It's, it's using this 16 inch wide by seven eighth inch thick top flange. Uh, I mentioned earlier we're using ASTM A709 grade 50W. So our yield stress and our tensile um, stress resistance, um, th those are entered in there. The bottom flange is the same, the same thing. You, can gen you generally are going to get thicker uh, and wider sections for your bottom flange, I would say typically. I have one more uh, section that I'm looking at, a little more butt splice, but it's essentially the same thing. The next is the slab tab, and that is for your deck slab, your concrete, reinforced concrete deck slab. And this is where we're really giving Simon what the composite 
properties are to, to account for in our um, composite section. So um, in the positive moment regions, you don't really get the benefit of the uh, deck seal. It's not in your tension flange, so you don't really get the benefit. So there's no reason to enter it. So I have zero square inches. Um, you can see I'm, I'm using eight inches for my thickness, and that's because that's my, um, that's my structural thickness. I have a half inch sacrificial or integral wearing surface. And so, so half inch is just dead load, can't count on it for capacity. And our effective slab width, that's um, what the overhang plus half of our girder spacing is for this girder, 111 inches. Next is our field splice location. We've, uh, I, I actually kept this the same from the continuous band standard input, 120 feet worked well. You wanna make sure that's not at a cross frame location. In general, I'd say you want to be two to three feet at least away, so you avoid your web splice plates. You're not framing your, your cross frame into your web splice plates. And this last tab is sort of optional. If you want to look at your deck pour sequence, um, you can consider it. If you, you also don't have to enter anything. In general, you're going to pour your, your positive moment regions first and your uh, negative moment regions second. And that's to limit the tensile stresses in your in your bridge deck to, to prevent cracking. Uh, if you remember, concrete is, is weak in tension, so we need steel in there to, to help reduce the cracks. So for span two, wanted to show this as well. You can see it's pretty much the same thing. We have a few more entries because we're we, we have another splice location and a few more cross frame locations but it's the same name of the game. We're, we're entering in our web depth, the thickness, and the, the yield stress. The top flange, it's, it's similar as well. You can see we got a few more sections because we have a, a center field section in the middle that's 90 feet. And um, once again, our thicker, wider sections are over our piers, and we can skinny it up a bit at, at, in the center of the span. Similarly for the bottom flange, uh, we get thicker sections for our compression flange over the piers, and, and then it gets a little bit reduced at, um, at the center of the span. For the slab tab, we have one more entry because now we have two negative moment locations at um, both at, at pier one and at pier two. So you can see now we just, we're, we're just counting on that negative moment steel in two locations instead of just one. As I mentioned before, we have two field splices. Um, I left this the same two, I think. And we have a 90 foot field section there in the middle. Then we're looking uh, at the deck pour sequence. It's the same thing. We're gonna pour that positive moment region first and the negative moment um, region second after, after those sections have cured. So all that, and now we're ready to go ahead and run our analysis. Uh, you can toggle the analyze dropdown and you can validate your results first and then you can run the analysis. I'm showing the results control tab. This is how I like to run it. Um, I encourage you to look at the Simon user's guide for more information on this, but I, I like the printing more details essentially. It gives me more information, more sectional properties and uh, more output. So the results files, they can come in uh, three forms if you, uh, depending on what you like and what's your, your, your desire there. Uh, I, I prefer just looking at it in Simon itself over here on the left, but it also has XML format and you can also open it in a notepad or in a similar app um, if, if you prefer to look at the output that way. And so we get all that and uh, you know, in any software program, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, sanity check your results and ask if it's reasonable. Does it does it look right? So um, these are the moments right from the output. I'm going to go ahead and plot those in Excel. Um, you can see we still have pretty good um, balance. Our our moments kind of are similar, and um, they look they look reasonable. You can check those by hand with our moment shears and reactions for continuous highway bridges also on our website. Um, and similarly, I'll do the same thing for shear. So 
I'll, I'll, I'll plot those, make sure you see the transition um, flipping at the pier and um, kind of equal magnitudes, negative and positive shear over the piers. And those look reasonable. Uh, I mentioned the web depth optimizer uh, optimization. I wanted to show, I, I did use this uh, after I had concluded this design. And back under general properties, uh, you would toggle the design mode instead of the analysis mode. And on the web depth optimization tab, you'd then say yes, um, you, you, you wanna use the optimization. And then you're, you can select up to five variations below and five variations above. And that's gonna start with where you've defined the web. And it can go up or down in the variations based on a fixed um, increment, which I've chosen for two inches. But you can also use a percentage-based increment if you'd like. So it takes a minute to run that, especially if you if you select a you know a lot of different variations. But um, towards the bottom, uh, if everybody can, it's kind of hard to see. But for our 80-inch uh, deep section, you can see. 362.05 uh, tons. That's actually probably the most efficient of all those. Um, there is one, the 88 inch depth, uh, deep uh, design that Simon ran slightly had less, but we have to, you know, get eight inches deeper. And actually when I open that, you know, uh, these aren't necessarily perfect. You, you still need to kind of go through and optimize some, some flanges. So it ended up being that, that, that we picked a pretty good depth and uh, the continuous span standards, I think, had it right. So back to our results, um, you'll 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 scroll all the way down, and based on uh, what permissible um, performance ratio you allow, um, in general, you want that to be less than 1.0. What's the factor demand divided by the factor resistance? And you can see we got a 0.956, um, which looks pretty efficient, and and pretty good, but perhaps we could further optimize that even further. Um, it really never never ends. Um, you, you can always improve it. We, we need to verify the interior girder design works for the same section. We don't want to have different exterior and interior girders uh, for our bridge. And I did verify that. It, it does work. Um, so that's good news. But we could also uh, further talk to our local NSBA regional bridge specialist, uh, perhaps a, a an AISC steel fabricator, certified steel fabricator to uh, maybe get some other comments on, on the efficiency of our design and, and how we can optimize costs. But so if your results were, were greater than 1.0, what do you wanna do? It kind of depends on what's not working. Um, in general, when shear is, is not working or, or it's overstressed, you, you're, gonna, um, you're gonna look at maybe thickening your web or perhaps um, playing with your stiffeners, um, going back to the cross-section tab and toggling if it's uh, stiffened or not stiffened, or perhaps look at two-sided stiffeners. Uh, for flexure, in general, we're gonna um, be increasing flange thickness depending on what's not working. Um, Simon does a good job of telling you uh, if it's negative moment and you're looking at the top flange or the bottom flange, you, you know, either one, it's gonna, it's gonna let you know. So you, you can adjust that accordingly. Um, and sometimes we also wanna consider moving our cross frame locations for lateral torsional buckling, but also uh, fatigue. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be controlled by that category C prime detail. And the way we uh, improve that uh, resistance is we beef up our uh, bottom flange at those locations if we're not passing. So the most important part of all this is probably working on your, your structural bridge design drawings that are gonna um, be handed off to uh, a contractor and a fabricator. And uh, you know they don't know what goes into your model. So it's gotta be right when you, when you put it, the details on the page. Um, this is what I uh, have been talking about this whole time. So it kind of gives you a visual representation we have five field sections that ranging from 90 to 120 feet, pretty reasonable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our cross frame spacing was 29 feet uh, in uh, kind of in the positive moment regions. And then we get two uh, 20 foot 
cross frame and uh, pier diaphragm spacings. And then it widens back up to 32 feet in the center span. And it's symmetric about the center line of span too. Uh, I mentioned earlier too, you also wanna look at those field splice locations. We're avoiding those by about three feet, both, both of them. Um, and that's, that's probably a pretty good, uh, pretty good way to do it. I, I think three feet is pretty comfortable, not too close. And I went ahead and detailed um, the girder elevation. So you can see the flange sizes and the web, um, where those cross frames are and how this looks. This is always sometimes a, it, it's nice to detail this because it also makes sure you didn't make any mistakes uh, in your model and, and that you're detailing the same thing that you, you put in there. And uh, it also is a, a good way to kind of see if we can further optimize our flanges, which perhaps we, we could. And with all that, I, I wanted to leave some time for questions. So, so thank you, everyone. Um, and I've, I've got my contact information if anybody wants to reach out um, for more, more particulars on this.